Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I am a senior staff attorney at the Education Law Center. I work on these issues a lot, both at the state level and at the national level. Um, and I, we've been very concerned about the poor educational outcomes of kids while they're in the foster care system. And we know a lot now about the unique educational barriers to success. It includes school stability. It's estimated that you lose between four to six months of educational progress with every school move. I've represented children who have been in 27 different schools while they've been in foster care. We know that immediate enrollment is critical, and it's now a protection of our federal law. When the Every Student Succeeds Act was passed in December of 2015, and is now in full force in, in December of 2016, it ensures school stability for every child in foster care, and it ensures immediate enrollment without providing documents for all children in foster care. So we know that that's a critical issue. It does apply to children in residential placements by virtue of this new federal law. It is one thing that state law needs to address is to ensure that school stability follows the child after reunification. So that's a critical, important issue. So school stability makes a critical difference, and it's now on the radar at the federal level and at the state level. And that happened because of the testimony of youth in foster care who came forward and provided a hearing at the federal level that we were um, involved with that talked about these issues and why school stability was important. But there are other issues that are also important to address the barriers for students. We know that they're more likely to be truant, that there are issues around disproportionality with regard to school discipline. We know that credit transfer is a huge issue for children in foster care. And also, there's sometimes disparity between the education that's provided when you're in a residential setting versus the education that you receive and the credits that are recognized when you come back to your community school. So these are issues that at the state level are being addressed. There is legislation in several jurisdictions that says that children in foster care have to have access to a point of contact in their school district. And that's part of the legislation at the federal level under the Every Student Succeeds Act. If you have a child welfare education advocate, you must have one in your school district. And the responsibilities of that person are to ensure that your credits count ensure that you're in an appropriate school placement, which is often a huge issue for kids in foster care if the school doesn't know them and they're not sure where they should be placed. It ensures that that child has access to special education services, which we know are of critical importance. Or if a child doesn't need special education, but needs a 504 or accommodations plan in school to address behavioral issues that are important, that can be accomplished. So having that point of contact makes a difference in a school. Having a mentor in your school means that you are one third more likely to graduate from high school. We know that's of critical importance at the school level. So ensuring that we're addressing all of those issues, ensure that children have access to extracurricular activities. There's a jurisdiction in Cincinnati, Ohio, it's called Kids in School Rule. They have a specific program for all kids in foster care to make sure that you have access to extracurriculars. They ensure that you have a mentor. They have a 100% graduation rate. We know that nationwide, you, the 50% of children in the foster care system do not graduate in four years. We need to change that statistic. We know that the overwhelming majority of youth that have been surveyed, 76%, say that their goal is to go to college. Sadly, only 13 to 17% ever apply, and a small fraction of those actually succeed at a four-year college. So we need to look at our colleges, too. How can they better support children in foster care? There are a lot of states that are doing the in-state tuition to support kids, but also having the resources that you need while you are at the higher ed level makes a significant difference. The majority of children drop out of school at that first year in their freshman year of college. We can change that if we have the supports and services that children need in foster care. Why? We know it's been done in the homeless context for children who have experienced homelessness, and it makes a critical difference in providing that support. So there's a lot that can be done on the education side, but we also need to look to our judiciary and what they're doing. And it's terrific, the work that you've been doing here. But we need to ensure that all judges are doing that, that we're involving parents at every, at, at every stage of that process 
so that they're involved with schools. And we have the input of people who know this child. And resource parents, we need to hear that voice. We need to hear the voice of youth. Often youth are not even involved in a process where we're making decisions about them. We need to do that. So the judiciary must ensure that we're looking at education issues at all stages of the adjudicatory process. Not only is the child attending school, but how are they doing? And do they need other interventions? Can we change our court orders? Are we clear on who the educational decision maker is for this child? So California, Pennsylvania, uh, New York have all adopted rules that require judges to ask important questions about edu education at every stage of the process and that they, uh, they have the authority authority to appoint an educational decision maker if a child doesn't have that active parent who's really, really involved. And we need to look at our child welfare system too to ensure that caseworkers are looking at education, that they have a checklist or an education screen, that they're asking the questions, that they know what the legal entitlements are of children in the education system. And it takes parents and youth being involved, saying what children need, making a difference. At the Legal Center for Foster Care and Education, we have model rules, model policies for the judiciary. We also have model state laws that have made a critical difference for this exceptionally vulnerable cohort of children. And we know that if we collaborate, if we trust each other, if we recognize that school districts who actually knew nothing about fostering connections in 2008, I would call them and they would say, what are you talking about? I've never heard that law. I don't think it exists. I think you're making it up. I wasn't making it up, but now, as of 2016, they have a legal obligation to ensure not only school stability, not only immediate enrollment, but that they are collecting disaggregated data about the significantly underserved population of children. So every year, they have to issue a report card. How did the children in foster care do? Can you be doing something differently? But they don't know what to do. They need your help to decide that. So the more that we can collaborate between all of these systems, child welfare and the courts and the school districts actually are late to come to the party, but they're there now at the table. We need to really do that, to do what's in the best interests of children. We know from the research what the unique barriers are, and we know from youth and parents at a real level what would make a difference for kids. And if we can all work together, not only will educational outcomes quote unquote improve, kids will succeed, they will thrive, their lives will be dramatically different. They will be employed, they'll be more, more likely to achieve permanency in their lives. So it's a critical point of intervention, it's a critical opportunity for all of us. And I thank you so much for this opportunity to speak here today, and congratulations to all the honorees. <laughs>